Our New Testament lesson in the text for our sermon comes from the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 8. John 12, 1 through 8. Listen for the word of God. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Mary ser Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Here in the readings, let us pray. O oh God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. <clears throat> I still remember the day when I was about 13 or 14 years old and I had bought myself a pair of bass shoes. These were made by the same company that manufactures the bass weegeons you still see and I still wear. But these were a Thai version. I had bought these with money I had made cutting grass. They were expensive shoes, at least for those of us purchasing our other shoes at a store like Walmart. But I remember my dad admiring my purchase and saying, I would like to have a pair of those someday. In looking back, I realized that he didn't say this with regret or jealousy or to make a point of any kind. He was merely stating a reality. His money went to put food on the table and clothes on everyone's back. Expensive shoes were not in his family budget. Now, all parents understand this. We will do things for our children we won't do for ourselves. This sacrifice is a part of what it means to be a parent. And most of us learn it from our parents. Usually it is not until we are older that we realize the sacrifices our parents made for us. I still have moments of chagrin that I did not recognize what my parents did without so that I might have wasn't that I was ungrateful, but as a child growing up, I just never thought about it. I now know my dad dragged himself off to that oil refinery every day so I would have opportunities that were not available to him. My mother carpooled me to basketball practice, little league games, the library, so I could experience a larger life. And only in my later years did I come to realize and appreciate full extent of the sacrifice they made so my life could be better. Now, I thought about this because our scripture is about sacrifice and appreciation. Jesus has come to Bethany, a small village outside of Jerusalem. It is the home of sisters Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Their reoccurring appearances in the Gospels tell us that they were friends of Jesus. And Lazarus is the person Jesus raised from the dead, which gives a foreboding sense to this incident. It was after the raising of Lazarus that the religious authorities decided to pursue Jesus to arrest him and then turn him over to the Romans who would kill him. In fact, in the previous chapter, the gospel writer John tells us Jesus could no longer travel, travel openly for fear of arrest. 
And yet, here he is, in plain sight, having dinner with the very man and his sisters who got him into such deep trouble. Now, this story is a turning point in the gospel according to John. As John focuses our attention on what we now call Holy Week, the mood changes. The cross begins to loom before us, which again gives context to our story. On his way to Jerusalem in what will be the last week of his earthly life, Jesus stops to have dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. As their personalities have demonstrated previously, Martha is cooking and serving food. But her sister Mary pursues another task. She takes a pound of costly perfume, anoints Jesus' feet with it, and then wipes his feet with her hair. The quantity, expense, and value of the perfume is indicated by the statement that its fragrance filled the entire house. But this expensive fragrance also fills the nostrils of another who has a different view of its extravagance. Confronting Mary in the presence of Jesus, Judas Iscariot accuses, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Now, the Gospel writer John, never one to shy away from prejudicing us about the characters in his Gospel, tells us Judas asked this question not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was the group's treasure, carried the common purse for Jesus and his disciples, and John informs us that Judas was tipping his fingers into the till. So Judas' accusation grew out of his frustration that he would not possess the opportunity to get his hands on a piece of this perfume's value. But Jesus rebukes Judas with both a statement that gives focus to the incident and a scripture passage that is usually employed out of context. Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Tony Campalo, the well-known Christian teacher and author, tells a great story on himself. One day in Philadelphia, he prepares to leave for work, and it's raining cats and dogs, but he can't find an umbrella. So he runs from the house to the car and from the car to the train. Well, at the end of the train ride, he instinctively grabs the umbrella on the seat next to him. The lady sitting two seats down indignantly looks at him and says, That's mine. Well, he apologizes and goes off to work. At the end of the day, his wife calls and reminds him to bring home all the umbrellas he has left at work. So he gathers up about six umbrellas he finds in the bottom of his office closet, and when he gets on the train, guess who is sitting beside him? That's right. It's the same woman he sat next to that morning, the same one who said, that's my umbrella. As he sits down with his arm full of umbrellas, she looks at him and says, my, you've had a good day, haven't you? <laughs> well, Judas tries to place the same guilt on Mary, essentially looking at her in the perfume and saying, my, you've had a good day, haven't you? Now, one of the pr main purposes of this story is to enable us to juxtapose Mary and Judas Iscariot. Su superficially, one is good and one is bad. But actually, Judas asks a good question. A laborer in Palestine earned about a denarius a day, so the perfume was worth a full year's salary. That would feed a lot of poor people. So Judas's question is a serious one. And its serious nature was what gives weight to Mary's action. The only way we will fully comprehend the meaning of this incident is to place ourselves within it. And the first thing we have to do is get the numbers right. The figure of 300 denarii is central to the story. Now, some of you sitting here today make over $250,000 a year. Many have salaries over $100,000. Likely a good portion of you would make over forty or fifty thousand dollars. Well, three hundred denarii was a year's salary. 
Mary spent a full year's wages to buy ointment to rub on Jesus' feet. Otherwise, if you truly want to grasp what John is telling us, you and I have to ask ourselves, am I willing to spend $50,000 or $250,000, whatever my yearly salary is, for Jesus? John wants us to see the extravagance of Mary's action. There is no indication Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were wealthy people. This was an extravagant gift of love and appreciation. But it's not just the money. Note that Mary wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. We know that in Palestine, only a prostitute would let her hair down in public. For Mary to perform this costly act of love, she had to open herself to the charge of being an unseemly woman. And then notice that Mary anoints Jesus' feet. Typically, one honored a guest by anointing his head. In Palestine, people either went barefoot or wore sandals. Consequently, people's feet were the dirtiest, nastiest, most unclean part of one's body. The washing or anointing of one's feet was an act of humility as well as love. So Mary's action displayed an extravagance financially, socially, and emotionally. Writing in the Christian Century Magazine, seminary professor Tom Long, who has twice been a heritage lecturer here at Westminster, told a story about one of his seminary students. A number of years ago, the young man and his father, an inner-city pastor, were jogging in the neighborhood when they decided to have a pizza delivered to their home. On their way to a payphone, a homeless man asked them for change. Without a second thought, the father reached into his pockets and said, Here, take what you need. Enormously grateful, the homeless man took every single coin. But as he turned to go, the father suddenly realized he had given away the change he needed to call the pizza place. Pardon me, he called to the man. I need to make a call. Can you spare some change? Turning, the homeless man emptied his pockets. As he held the change to the father, he said, Here, take what you need. Well, Mary held out everything she had, financially, socially, and emotionally offered it all to Jesus. After Mary's act, John introduces Judas into the story. John wants us to compare these two figures. The central question he wants us to ask is, which has correctly interpreted the significance of Jesus? And what I find most interesting and frightening about Judas's question is that he employs religious language and motivation to further his own agenda. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Otherwise, let me see how guilty I can make you feel for what you have just done. But as John reminds us, Judas' concern is not the poor, but himself. The passage is a stark reminder of how easily we can blur the line between personal and religious motivations. Because on the surface, this is a legitimate question, but it is also a warning that we must always analyze our motivation and actions before we question another's. John wants us to ask ourselves what we are willing to do for Jesus. Are we displaying extravagant love toward the master socially, emotionally, financially? And if we are not, are we covering our lack of commitment with pious but false reasoning that at its heart covers our concern for ourselves? The passage prompts each and every one of us to look at ourselves and ask, not only what am I willing, 
but what am I doing for Jesus? In her book, Leaving Church, well-known preacher Barbara Brown Taylor quotes Susan B. Anthony, who once said, I distrust those people who know so well what God wants them to do because I notice it always coincides with their own desires. As religious people, like Judas, we always carry the potential to mistake our words for God's. In reading this story, John wants us to ask ourselves what we are willing to do for Jesus. But he also wants to remind us what Jesus did for us. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The oft-quoted, you always have the poor with you, comes from Deuteronomy 15, 11, which concludes with the words, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. This, along with Jesus' entire ministry, indicate these words are not an escape from our responsibility to the poor. This isn't an either-or proposition or decision. It would be more accurate to call it a both-and. But the focus at this moment is Jesus and his impending sacrifice. The use of the ointment that was bought for his burial indicates that Jesus' suffering and death are imminent. Now, Jesus was not obtuse. He knew that by coming to Bethany, he was placing himself in harm's way. His appearance in Bethany was a demonstration of courage and calling. In the context of Mary's extravagant act of love and Judas's selfishness, we are reminded of the complete voluntary sacrifice Jesus is about to make for you and me. Mary's monetary, social, and emotional gift is placed in context because it pales in comparison to what she receives in return from Jesus. Some of you may have heard the story about the U.S. Naval officer who, after World War II, was attending a conference that included admirals from both the U.S. and French navies. At a cocktail reception, the officer found himself in a small group that included personnel from both navies. A French admiral began complaining that whereas Europeans learn many languages, Americans learn only English. He then asked, why is it that we have to speak English in these conferences rather than you speak French? Without hesitation, the American admiral replied, maybe it's because the British, Canadians, Australians, and Americans arranged it so you would not have to speak German. <laughs> Mary's sacrifice was significant for her, but it pointed to a much larger sacrifice. Any religious act of sacrifice on our part is only a reminder of what Jesus gave for you and for me. Isn't that a little over the top? That is what Judas was asking Mary. How could you do that much for Jesus? The passage calls us to ask ourselves what we do for Jesus. With someone else looking at our pledge card, our time spent helping in Sunday school, youth groups, it's elementary, or singing in the choir say that we were being too extravagant? This morning, as each of us contemplates how we serve Christ, how we respond to his sacrifice for us, are you and I 
striving to be a little over the top. 